All right, so go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, we're going to be reading the commandments in chapter 5, and we're also going to be looking at chapter 6, verse 13. So, as I was researching my sermon today on the commandments, I started by once again updating my table of the commandments. If you were here in person last week, you remember this table. If you're joining us online, then you haven't seen it yet, but I made it colorful for you, so it should be a lot easier to read. Uh, you'll notice that I've highlighted the Talmudic numbering of the commandments. This is the numbering that I prefer. I don't take any issue to the Septuagint's numbering or to the Calvinist numbering, but I do find the Lutheran and Catholic numbering problematic because, and you may remember this from last week, because of the order of the two statements, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, being reversed in Exodus and Deuteronomy. So considering these as separate commandments is somewhat problematic because it means that they are reversed in order depending on which passage you're reading. So, like I said, I take no issue with three of these because the numbering doesn't really make much of a difference. It doesn't change the order of the commandments. But the Lutheran, Lutheran and Catholic numbering I've included in case you come from one of those traditions and you're wondering why I'm using different numbers. This is why. So, today we're going to start with the third commandment. Right, We did commandments 1 and 2 last week, along with commandment number 7. And so this week is going to be all commandment number 3. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And this is a very important commandment, but it's one that we have a history of interpreting broadly and often problematically. Because we take the idea of taking the name of the Lord in vain as blasphemy or cursing or swearing. And we tend to interpret this broadly as being a commandment against cussing of any kind, of any kind of foul language. Any language that we take issue with falls under this commandment. And that's really not what it's saying, and it's not a healthy way of viewing this particular commandment. George Carlin famously poked fun at this idea that there are just words you cannot say. And he popularized the idea of the seven words you can never say on television. And of course, I want to publish, publish this to YouTube so you can look up George Carlin's seven words you can't say on television on YouTube if uh, you feel so inclined, but I will not be repeating them. But in 2004, in an interview, he said that these words, and he's talking about his seven cuss words, these words have no power. We give them this power by refusing to be free and easy with them. We give them great power over us. They really, in themselves have no power. It's the thrust of the sentence that makes them either good or bad. And in my own research, I identified, other than racial slurs or slurs against gender or sexuality, um, 10 words that you really can't say on television even today. And out of, out of those 10, I noted only one of them was religiously problematic. The rest are just kind of gross. They're bodily functions. They're parts of the body. And that really doesn't offend God, I don't think. I think God created the entire body. But notably, none of them are blasphemy. None of them are the name of God. They're vulgar. But they're not blasphemous. They're not profane in a religious sense. So the question is, the use of profanity may be unpleasant, but is it sinful? 
Well, the Bible doesn't say. It wasn't written in English, and the particular history of the English language which leads to us using cuss words doesn't exist in Hebrew. So the Bible simply doesn't have anything to say about this. So the question, a better question might be, why do we cuss at all? According to psychologist Steven Pinker, there are five possible functions of cussing, five reasons why we use vulgar language. One is the use of idiom. It's used as a sign that the conversation and relationship between speaker and listener is informal. So the reason that I won't cuss in my sermon is because it's not informal speech. I'm giving a speech. And so if I were to cuss, it would break that relationship. It would be jarring. The next use of vulgar language would be emphasis to draw attentional, uh, additional attention to what is considered to be worth paying attention to. Now, there are a lot of ways of doing this, and I'm not going to go over any of them. The next use is catharsis. Say you stub your toe and say something you shouldn't. It's used to express pain or misfortune. Now, the last two, the Bible does have something to say about. But it's pretty obvious, and I don't think I need to start quoting scripture over it. The use of a derogatory. To convey that the speaker thinks negatively of the subject matter, and that you should too. Those are those words that I didn't include in my ten cuss words, because... They are derogatories. They are slurs. And the last usage, which is definitely sinful, it is definitely problematic, is abuse. It is, it is intended to offend, intimidate, or otherwise cause emotional or psychological harm. This use of language is abusive whether the words themselves are prof profanity or not. And it doesn't matter if the words themselves are bad words, if you're using them, if you're using language in a derogatory or abusive manner. This breaks your relationship with the listener. You are not being a good neighbor to that person by using language in that way. But none of these really violate the third commandment, do they? None of them are taking the Lord's name in vain. And that's because calling cussing, cursing, or swearing, as we do, these are synonyms, right? Cussing, cursing, swearing, except that they're not really. Cursing and swearing is a misnomer. It's moralizing something that the Bible doesn't address. Cussing is not addressed in Scripture, but cursing and swearing are. So in order to moralize against cussing, we moralize against cursing and swearing. So while cussing may be vulgar or coarse, it's not the same as the pronouncement of a curse or the swearing of an oath. Cursing or swearing in this context is what scripture is concerned with. In general, God doesn't care if you use four-letter words. God does care if you pronounce hate or swear violence against others. So, from the perspective of scripture, a curse is just one way of swearing. It is swearing violence or retribution. The common, God damn it, may be a curse, but it's more likely simply a vulgarity. Whereas a pronouncement beginning, as God is my witness, that's an oath. That's swearing. And oaths are what the third commandment is actually referring to. So, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. And I'm reading from the New English Translation, the Net Bible. 
And here it says, you must revere the Lord your God, serve him, and take oaths using only his name. You must not go after other gods, those of the surrounding peoples, for the Lord your God, who is present among you, is a jealous God. His anger will erupt against you and remove you from the land. So here we see that God does want us to swear. God wants us to, to make promises to one another. He wants us to swear oaths. But to do what? Well, certainly not out of vengeance. Certainly not the kind of oath that begins, as God is my witness. <laughs> certainly not that kind of swearing. But when you make your wedding vows, don't you swear to do something? You swear to do right. When you start a new job, you swear to be loyal to your employer. When you start any venture, really, you swear to do something. When we start the new year, we make a resolution. Aren't we swearing to do something good? These are the kinds of oaths that God is asking us to make. A promise to do good. When we're baptized, we promise that we will forgive, that we will live in the image of Jesus, and that we will accept forgiveness as well. We promise to die and be born again, to live for God for the rest of our days and for all eternity. These are the kinds of oaths that God wants, and only in his name. So when you swear, or when you say, well, by Jove or by Jupiter, well, that's swearing in the name of another God, isn't it? And maybe that's not how we mean it today. Really, when people did say things like that a long time ago, what they were trying to do was not swear in the name of the Lord, because that would be violating the commandment. But inadvertently, in trying to protect themselves from violating the commandment, they do exactly that, as it says in here in Deuteronomy, that we must not take oaths in the names of other gods. Now let's take a look at the commandment itself. I'm going to start in Exodus chapter 20, and then we're going to move on to Deuteronomy chapter 5. So here in Exodus 20, verse 7, it says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will, will not hold guiltless anyone who takes his name in vain. Now, what does that mean? Just like in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God here, well, Moses here, is talking about swearing by the name of the Lord and not doing what you swore you will do. That's taking the name of the Lord in vain. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, it says something very similar. In verse 11, it says, You must not make use of the name of the Lord your God for worthless purposes. Now, that would be when you stub your toe and say, God damn it! That's useless purposes, isn't it? And that's possibly here a violation of the commandment. For the Lord will not exonerate anyone who abuses his name that way. So God wants us to use his name. He wants us to say his name, to take our oaths in his name. But he doesn't want us to abuse his name. He doesn't want us to put it towards useless purposes or purposes that we cannot uphold ourselves. Now, it's interesting here that I've gone this entire sermon talking about not using the name of the Lord in vain, and I haven't once told you the name of the Lord. And that's because there is another tradition around the name of the Lord, and the Jewish tradition is to not pronounce it at all. You 
probably know the four letters uh, yod He vav He in Hebrew or Y-H-W-H in English. Those four letters constitute the name of the Lord and they are never pronounced. In fact, today we don't even know how to pronounce them because the long-standing prohibition against pronouncing the name had lasted so long people forgot how to pronounce it. So, strictly speaking, this commandment isn't something we can violate. Well, there's some two dozen or so possible pronunciations of the name of the Lord. If you're really determined, I think you could violate it, but it, it would take you a while. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that's not really what the commandment is about. It's about being honest with one another. It's about upholding what we say we will do, having integrity. And that's what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. Here, Jesus is asked about taking oaths, and he says simply, let your word be yes, if yes, or no, if no. More, from, more than this is from the evil one. It's not about the pronunciation of the name of the Lord. It's not about whether we use profanity. What it's about is having integrity and doing what we say we will do. We make our promises to God because, as Jesus tells us, we cannot control anything. If we swear by the holy city, we don't have ownership of the holy city. If we swear by ourselves, we cannot, by wishing it, make one hair white or black. He tells us we don't even control our own bodies. How can we take these oaths? So simply, let your yes mean yes or your no mean no. Have integrity in yourself. This is the point of the third commandment. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Do not put it towards worthless purposes. Because we are the temple of the Lord. We, the church are the Lord's temple. And so when we put ourselves towards useless purposes, when we put ourselves in a place where we have no honesty or integrity, we are putting the Lord's name in vain. We are taking, excuse me, the Lord's name in vain. Because just as people would swear by the temple, so today we, the church, are the temple. So, Let's hold to this commandment. Let's have honesty with one another. Let's have integrity. Let's be open and forgive one another. Just as we said we would do when we were baptized. This is what the Lord wants. This is what the third commandment means. So next week, we'll keep looking at these commandments. I'm hoping we'll be able to meet in person again. Um, and that... The, this winter time of year when we all seem to be getting sick will be treating us all a little bit better. So until then, peace be with you.